Next day, however, there was a sudden change of feeling and people began to think how cruel and how unprecedented such a decision was. To destroy not only the guilty, but the entire population of a state. Thucydides. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 80, The Fate of Mytilene. We have now finished with the events of the third year of the war, and as you have seen, a lot has been taking place in this early stage of the conflict. We saw that a resolution had been reached in the siege that had been taking place at Potidaea. Both sides probably relieved that this had taken place. However, the political class in Athens had been displeased with the outcome, believing they could have secured a more complete victory there. Though even with this resolution and Athens regaining control of Potidaea, much of the Chalcidides was still hostile towards Athens. This had seen a fresh offensive opened by Athens to attempt to secure their control in the region. However, we would witness one of the early examples of lighter troops being able to defeat the heavier armed hoplites. Athens would be forced to fall back into Potidaea, though would retain control of the city. Last episode, we also saw the first naval engagement that would take place between Sparta and Athens. This would take place in the Corinthian Gulf, not far from the Athenian port in the region at Neopactus. It would begin as a Peloponnesian operation and would be launched with cities friendly to the Peloponnesians seeking assistance in expanding their influence. This would also have the intention of removing Athenian influence, a prospect Corinth was very enthusiastic about, since they held a lot of interests in the area. However, the Peloponnesian fleet would be split and not act as a united force, which would see the land offensive in the west fail. While it would also provide Formio, who was in command of a small Athenian fleet in the region, a chance to sail out and challenge the Peloponnesian actions. This would end up seeing two naval engagements take place. The first would be against the Corinthians and Siconians, who had sailed from Corinth after the Spartan force had already arrived on the west coast. Formio, although outnumbered, more than two to one, would engage this fleet as he saw they would be laden down with extra troops and supplies to support the land campaign. This would see his fleet have the advantage of speed and manoeuvrability. The resulting battle would be an overwhelming victory for the Athenians. Though Sparta withdrawing from their defeat on land would meet back up with the defeated Corinthians and Siconians, where preparations for an assault on the Athenians was being planned now that the whole Peloponnesian fleet had united. This second attempt would get off to a promising start, with them having essentially defeated half the Athenian fleet in one manoeuvre. Though, the Peloponnesians act in splitting their forces would once again lead to a disastrous result. With a little luck and being able to focus on a single ship that separated from another detachment, the Athenians were able to inflict panic into the overconfident Peloponnesians, which would end up spreading to the main fleet. While the imminent arrival of Athenian reinforcements would see the Peloponnesians call off any continued effort against Neopactus. The Spartan commanders were desperate to deliver some success for the year, and would attempt an ambitious assault on Athens' own home port, at the Piraeus. Though being late in the campaigning season, the weather, and perhaps some nerves on the commander's part, would see this attempt foiled also, bringing a close to operations for 429 BC. For this episode, we'll be heading into 428 BC, where in Athens, the political landscape and its dynamic had changed. The death of Pericles the previous year would bring to a close an era of Athenian politics that had been dominated by him. New figures would now emerge to drive Athenian policy forward through the war. Our focus today will be on a fresh rebellion within the Athenian Empire taking place on Lesbos, which would also motivate Spartan actions for the year. Much of our focus will also be on how Athens would respond to this revolt while Athenian politics was adjusting to the departure of Pericles. It is probably no surprise, with the departure of Pericles from the pages of history, great change would occur in the political landscape in Athens. Pericles had influenced Athenian policies for decades and had only very brief absences during his career. One can ask, given the influence of his policies, was there someone else who could have picked up from where he left off to continue Athens through the war? That had been part of his inner circle. Well, for the first part of the answer to this question, we can probably turn to the great tragedy of the plague. This had laid many low, including a number of Pericles' associates. Perhaps his natural successor may have been among these men. However, Thucydides provides the second part of our answer, with those who still remained. He would tell us that those who were aligned with Pericles were more on an equal level with each other. This would see that one of them was not able to gain the support of the rest 
and a level of unity that Pericles had been able to command. With this being the situation now, politics in Athens would begin to open up for other figures that would have factions forming behind them. The two main influential figures that would emerge to the forefront after Pericles' death would be Nicias and Cleon, and we would be told that these two men were very different in character to each other. Nicias, we are told, had the qualities of what we could describe as a gentleman today, with him leading his life with strict attention to virtue. Cleon, on the other hand, is often described as a warmonger, a demagogue, and a vulgarian. This term demagogue is one that we'll start to see more and more as the years go by. It is a term used to describe a political leader who seeks support by appealing to the desires and prejudices of ordinary people, rather than by using rational argument. So it is probably no surprise that Cleon had gained influence through his skills of being able to appeal to the masses by addressing their emotions and using rhetoric to back up his policies and claims. On the other hand, we would be told that due to the nature of Nicias, he would use his wealth to gain influence on his side of the house. Plutarch would tell us that he would fund dramas, sporting events, festivals and building projects to gain popularity. Although these men had their differences, they also had some similarities in their background and thoughts on policy. Both would be from this new and upcoming class of politicians who were not from a noble upbringing, but had risen in importance through economic success. Nicias had become wealthy through the business of renting slaves to be used in the silver mines at Lorien, while Cleon would gain his through a tannery business he inherited from his father. When it came to the current situation in Athens, neither men favoured peace negotiations with Sparta, and both would seek policies for winning the war in the coming years. This would see that in the current crisis, both had virtually identical interests, with Donald Kagan outlining these. The empire must be kept safe for Athens. The Athenians must be imbued with a spirit to carry on the war. Resources must be husbanded and new ones found, and some strategy must be developed to resume offensive operations. Kagan also suggests that although they would head different factions, there is no reason to believe that both men were not cooperating to a large degree in these first few years after Pericles' death. Their interests would see that there would be motivations to do so and to outmaneuver any faction with interests counter to theirs. So now that we have a brief understanding of how the political landscape was looking after the departure of Pericles, let's now look to the new crisis that would develop for Athens within their empire as the war continued into 428 BC. The campaigning season of 428 would begin much the same as the previous years, with Sparta launching an invasion where they would once again return to Attica. Athens would treat this invasion like the others, remaining behind their walls with only their cavalry coming out to harass the lighter troops, from massing to lay waste to the areas close to the Athenian walls. The Peloponnesians, led once again by Archidamus, would remain in Attica for just under a month, ravaging the areas not yet touched and those showing signs of regrowth. This invasion seems to have not lasted as long as the previous years, but if Athens thought that they had finally caught themselves a break, they would soon be brought back to the realities of this conflict. While the Peloponnesians were ravaging Attica, and even before, the island of Lesbos was conspiring a revolt from the Athenian Empire. This would cause great stress within Athens if Lesbos broke away. It was one of the biggest allies, along with Chios, within the empire that still retained their autonomy and supplied a fleet to the empire rather than tribute. This plot for revolt would begin in the most powerful city of the island of Lesbos, that of Mytilene, who had an oligarchic government. Some other lesser city-states on the island, also thought to be oligarchic in nature, would also follow Mytilene's lead. Though one democratic town on the north coast had its own independent policies and had sometimes been hostile, with the others. The preparations for this revolt had also begun before the campaigning season of 428 had started. Mytilene had been constructing defensive walls, preparing their harbour and increasing the size of their navy. They would also use their trade link to the Black Sea to secure increased stores of grain and purchase the use of mercenary bowmen. However, these would take time to arrive. With all these preparations in motion, it would only be a matter of time before their scheme would get out. Mytilene had detractors, the nearby island of Tenedos, and the democratic elements on Lesbos, while there would also be dissenters within their own city as well. 
Through these channels, Athens would learn of what was being put in motion on Lesbos. With the cat out of the bag, Mytilene would be forced to act, even though they had not completed all the preparations they would have liked. Once Athens caught wind of what was being arranged on Lesbos, the Thucydides would point out that they did not want to believe such an enterprise was in the works. He says that they wanted to believe what they had been told was not true, their hardships for the war and plague seeing them not want to have to deal with another crisis. However, if Athens did nothing, this would be a huge blow to the city that was running low on money and men to man the fleet. Lesbos was a source of manpower for the fleet, while they were also an untapped resource in money since they had not yet been forced to provide tribute. An embassy would be arranged to make for Lesbos to get to the bottom of what Mytilene was up to. They were able to confirm that a conspiracy on Lesbos was underway, and the Athenian envoys had failed to convince Mytilene to abandon it. Athens now had another crisis to deal with, and looked to take the initiative to try and stamp it out as soon as possible. A fleet of 40 ships was making its preparations to sail around the Peloponnese, though they would now be diverted to Lesbos. The fleet had been informed if they made haste across the Aegean, they might well surprise the island, as a religious festival was underway that saw much of the population involved. However, the Athenian plans were reported back to Mytilene. Being a democracy, it can be very difficult keeping plans secret when so many people need to be present to vote on actions to be undertaken. Back in Mytilene, arrangements for the festival were abandoned, and the defensive works that had not yet been completed were manned. When the Athenian fleet did arrive, they quickly learnt that their arrival had been expected, so they would not be able to surprise the island into submission. Instead, they now provided orders for Mytilene to take down its walls and hand over its fleet. Though, these orders were ignored, and now the Athenians declared hostilities over the city. A half-hearted effort to challenge the Athenian fleet was deployed in the harbour, but the Athenians were able to drive them towards the shore. With the situation developing as it was, the commanders of Mytilene sought talks with the Athenians, where they looked to negotiate some sort of truce to save their ships. It would appear Athens was in a position of strength here, but the Zidides would tell us that they would accept an armistice that Mytilene was proposing. The reason here being that the Athenian commanders did not think they were in a strong position to take the rest of the island and would need additional forces. This would give Mytilene some breathing room now that their plan for revolt had been found out before they had made their preparations. To try and buy themselves some more time, they would now turn to diplomatic talks. Representatives would be sent to Athens to try and convince them of their innocent intentions and seek to have the Athenian fleet recalled. Though it would appear they did not expect these talks to be favourable, beyond the time it may buy them. So, while this mission was undertaken, a secret envoy was sent to Sparta to try and negotiate assistance. One of the motivations for rebelling against Athens was apparently so that Mytilene could unite the entire island under their leadership. Though, while part of the Athenian Empire, this sort of policy was discouraged by Athens, not wanting larger power units forming within their league. However, they would also seek Sparta's help, where they would present their official motivations for wanting to revolt. Mytilene had previously attempted to join the Peloponnesian League before the war had broken out, but Sparta had refused, this being during the period that both Athens and Sparta were looking to keep in effect the provisions of a 30 years peace. Mytilene would end up sending two separate envoys to Sparta to try and secure Spartan military aid. However, these attempts would be met with a somewhat air of indifference. It's thought here that Sparta was not very enthusiastic of becoming involved in supporting a revolt across the other side of the Aegean. Firstly, the initial encouragement for revolt had not come from Sparta, but from the Boeotians, who shared their common Aeolian connection. Plus, after the previous year's naval engagements against Athens, this probably would have not seen them too enthusiastic about the prospect of meeting Athens on the water again. Though even with this, the Spartans did not want to dismiss a chance at undermining the Athenian alliance, so they would tell the envoys to travel to Olympia, and at the completion of the festival taking place there, they could put forward their case to the rest of the Peloponnesians, who would be in attendance. If Sparta were to get involved in such a demanding operation that would divert resources away from any mainland venture, they needed to make sure that the rest of the Peloponnesians would be on board. After the Olympic festival had been completed, the Mytilenians 
would be given the opportunity to address the various members of the Peloponnesian League that were gathered in the sacred precinct of Zeus. The envoy from Mytilene had a huge task ahead of him to convince the Peloponnesians that they should come to their aid. The envoy would put to the side Mytilene's ambition for control on Lesbos and would instead focus on the ideals that Sparta had supposedly gone to war with Athens over. Thucydides would have the envoy deliver quite a long speech in attempting to do this. During the speech, he would point out that Peloponnesian intervention in Lesbos would serve the larger cause of Greek freedom and the aims of the Peloponnesian League. The envoy would also speak about Athens' encroachment on the autonomy of the various allies, while Mytilene would be the next victim if their revolt should fail. These points would directly address the justified reason that Sparta would go to war for, the freedom of all Greeks. He would then try to point out that the timing for action in the Aegean was perfect, where Thucydides would have the envoy say, Never has there been such an opportunity, owing to the plague and the expenses that they have incurred. The Athenians are in a state of exhaustion. Part of their fleet is sailing around your coasts, and the rest is engaged in blockading us. It is improbable that they have any ships in reserve, and if you invade for the second time this summer with naval and military forces at the same time, they will either be unable to resist your fleet, or will have to withdraw their own from your shores and from ours. It's interesting to see in this argument put forward that aid for the Mytilenians was not sought through direct military action on Lesbos. Instead, they were proposing for a combined naval and land operation to be directed at Attica. This prospect would be much more palatable to the Peloponnesians, and especially Sparta. This would mean that they would not need to engage in a long-range naval campaign that would have been seen as very unappealing. It seems very likely that Mytilene knew the Spartans' hesitancy at engaging in operations deep in the Athenian Empire, so looked to a proposal that would have been the best chance at succeeding. The main strategy in what was put forward would be to attempt to draw off the Athenian forces from Lesbos, so that Mytilene would be able to continue their plans for a control of the island. Obviously, to show that this was not all about their predicament, they would also highlight how the Peloponnesian actions would also aid their own situation. Then, to complete their speech to the Peloponnesians, the envoy would try and convince them that the war would not be decided in Attica, but rather in the wider Athenian Empire, while they would also reinforce the Spartans' justified reason for war in the first place. But if you give us your wholehearted support, you will gain for yourself a state, which has a large navy, which is a thing you need most. You will be in a much better position for breaking the power of the Athenians by detaching her allies from her, since the others will be greatly encouraged to come over to you, and you will clear yourselves the charge that has been made against you of not helping those who revolt. Once you come forward in the role of liberators, you will find that your strength in war is enormously increased. We have outlined the main points made in the address given by the envoy from Mytilene, though Thucydides would spend several pages outlining what was said. Nevertheless, the arguments put forward would be enough for the Spartans and Peloponnesians to agree to the proposals put forward. The Mytilenians and their allies would be welcomed into the Peloponnesian League, while preparations would now be made to launch another invasion into Attica. The various allies would be ordered to gather two-thirds of their forces at the Isthmus, while preparations were made to haul the triremes to carry the forces over the Corinthian Isthmus, where they could then be launched into the Saronic Gulf and sail directly into Attica. In these preparations, we would hear that the Spartans were energetic. However, their allies would drag their feet, as it was the season for harvesting their crops, and they would have thought that their military obligations had been already completed for this season. While these envoys were off attempting to gain Spartan help, actions had been taking place on Lesbos. As we had seen, the Athenians did not press their attack on Mytilene, as they thought they lacked the strength to sustain a campaign against the whole island. Though, after the naval action that had taken place, the Athenians had landed on the island and established a camp. There was perhaps a lull while Mytilene was having its talks with the Athenians, but with the failure of these, it then seems they would attempt action against the Athenians before reinforcements could arrive. We would hear that the forces of Mytilene would come out from their city and attack the Athenians camped outside. Here they would get the better of the Athenians, though did not follow up this victory, with it seeming they had also viewed themselves not strong enough to take on the Athenians offensively. 
It would appear they were awaiting the outcome of the talks with the Peloponnesians, where they could either receive reinforcements themselves or see the Athenians drawn away through an attack in Attica. It seems Mytilene was more interested in targeting the other cities of the island for the purpose of uniting all under their leadership, rather than taking the Athenians on. So instead of continuing their attacks on the Athenians, they retreated back into Mytilene. This would allow the Athenians to recover, and after they saw no new attacks would come their way, they would turn their minds to preparing to defend against renewed attacks, by establishing themselves in stronger positions on the island. This would see the Athenians call upon allies to sail to the island to reinforce them. Once this was done, the Athenians were then able to establish two fortifications outside Mytilene that would block the use of the port there. However, they were still far from an overwhelming force, with the Athenians only managing to exert control in the areas immediately outside their positions. This would become apparent with continued operations being undertaken by the two factions of the island. Back in Athens, they had become aware of the Peloponnesians' plan to invade Attica again in an attempt to draw off ships from Lesbos. So while the Peloponnesians were putting their operation into action, the Athenians would plan their response. They had judged that the Spartans assumed that the Athenians were in a weak state and unable to react in multiple theatres. This was a point that Mytilene had used to persuade the Peloponnesians into supporting them. Athens looked to show the Peloponnesians that they were still as strong as ever. To do this, they would not recall any ships from Lesbos, but would still manage to put to sea another 100 triremes. Athens did not have the rowers to support such a feat, so many of the hoplite class and resident aliens were put into service as rowers. The fleet would not be the same quality the previous years, but its purpose was to give the impression of strength. The Athenian fleet would be launched, and its operations would be directed at the Peloponnesian coastline, raiding coastal areas at will. This would all take place while the Peloponnesians were deploying themselves back within Attica. The Athenian effort, coupled with other factors, would see Sparta realise that Athens was not as weak as they had been led to believe. Though the failure of some of their allies to assemble on the Isthmus for the campaign, as well as a separate Athenian fleet of 30 ships that had been deployed before the troubles on Lesbos, would see that the second invasion of Attica was called off. The Athenians remained in their positions on Lesbos, but Mytilene was still able to launch attacks on other cities of the island. Athens was not able to do much to help the democratic cities of Lesbos, so further action was needed. Word was sent back to Athens to send reinforcements so that the army on Lesbos could start taking action against Mytilene. Athens, now free of the Peloponnesian invasion, would send 100 hoplites commanded by Parthus. To further highlight the severe shortage of rowers in Athens, the Thucydides would tell us that the hoplites themselves would row the triremes for the journey to Lesbos. Once arriving, the Athenians were now strong enough to operate outside of their camps. They would construct a wall around Mytilene, completely surrounding it on land. A number of forts would also be built along the wall that would be garrisoned by the hoplites. With the completion of this wall, Mytilene was now completely under siege. The navy had been able to blockade the city from the sea, but now they were closed in by land, unable to launch their attacks on the other cities they had been previously free to do. By this stage, the winter of 428 was now coming on, which would see the closing of another campaigning season. During this period, Athens would also take measures to secure more funds to continue fueling their war effort. Ships would be sent out to a number of cities where a direct tax was imposed on these cities. This system of direct taxation was not a common occurrence in these times, even though for us it seems quite normal. The Greeks saw this as an attack on their autonomy and property rights. Often these types of taxes would first start out in response to funding a crisis, which would normally be a major war. For example, in modern times, the British would first introduce an income tax to help pay for their wars against Napoleon, while here in Australia, our income tax would be in response to the First World War. However, these impositions during 428 BC would see that some cities would respond in a hostile nature, with Thucydides telling us one ill-fated mission on the far eastern end of the Athenian Empire into Carrion lands, where just about all were lost. During the winter, Sparta would also be active. Although they had withdrawn from Attica due to the Athenian raids on their coastlines, they were planning for a renewed effort for 427. 
This effort also had the intention of assisting Mytilene directly, and a messenger from Sparta had been sent across the Aegean to Lesbos, who was able to slip into the city past the Athenian blockade. The Spartan who arrived was named Alcidius, and had come to advise Mytilene of the Peloponnesians' attention to invade Attica once again in 427, while a fleet of 42 ships would also be sent to Lesbos to assist Mytilene. This news brought by Alcidius would also encourage the city and were now motivated to hold out against the Athenian siege. With the coming of the campaigning season of 427, the Peloponnesians would send off their fleet to Lesbos while also invading Attica with their land forces. The intention here was to prevent Athens from sending out additional ships to respond to the Peloponnesian fleet by keeping their forces in Athens busy. It would also appear that Archidamus, who had been leading the Peloponnesians in the previous years, was now ill and dying, or had already died. As this time around, the invasion was not led by him, and would end up hearing that his son Aegis would come to succeed him later in 427. This dual theatre operation by Sparta would not end up achieving the results that had been intended. The Peloponnesian army in Attica would devastate the countryside, with this being one of the worst years that Attica had endured. The Peloponnesians would stay on longer than normal, as they had been awaiting news of the fleet's progress on Lesbos, since it was their objective to tie down the Athenians and prevent them to launch their ships into the Aegean. Though with no news arriving, and the army now having expended all its supplies, they were forced to march back for the Peloponnese. Thucydides would tell us that the Peloponnesian fleet had sailed around the Peloponnese before heading into the Aegean with caution. They were very aware that if an Athenian fleet caught them on the sea, they were probably going to be severely outmatched. They were able to avoid any contact with the Athenians and had reached Delos, but once leaving and arriving at the island of Icarus, they would learn that Mytilene had surrendered to the Athenians on Lesbos. Once obtaining more information on what had taken place, the Peloponnesians now discussed what actions they should take. Proposals for continuing the offensive operations would be argued, with one seeking to have the fleet continue to Lesbos and take the Athenians by surprise. Another sought to instead direct the fleet in support of Ionian cities, looking to break away from the Athenian Empire. This would undermine the Athenians' income in these regions, while it could also spark a larger rebellion once it was seen Athens did not rule the seas. In addition to this, diplomatic connections could also then be opened up with the Persians. However, the Spartan commander was not convinced of these arguments, and instead wanted to sail the fleet back to the Peloponnese as quickly as possible, before any Athenian fleet would be encountered. Before setting back out, the Spartans would damage their reputation with some cities in the Aegean that had looked on them favourably, when they started executing prisoners they had taken during their travels through the region. They would release the rest once becoming aware of what their actions were doing, but the damage had been done. With the fleet now lightening their load, they made their way back to the Greek mainland. The Athenians would end up getting word of the Peloponnesians' position and would give chase. Though the Peloponnesians would avoid making land and risk the open seas until reaching the Peloponnese. By doing this, they were able to avoid a sea battle, with the Athenians giving up the chase. The slow progress of the Peloponnesian fleet, when they had set out to support Lesbos, would see that they would fail to reach the island to support Mytilene in time. The full blockade of the city had meant that no supplies were able to make it into the defenders, seeing that a timely response from the Peloponnesians was needed. Though Mytilene would reach a point of crisis with their food supply before they could arrive. An advisor from Sparta was present in the city and seeing the desperate state of the situation, had proposed a desperate plan to attempt to break the siege. This would call for the people of Mytilene to breach the Athenian wall that had been built around the city. However, Mytilene lacked the appropriate numbers of hoplites for this task. It's then here Thucydides tells us the curious step of providing hoplite equipment to the lower classes within the city, this taking place in a logarchic system. Once all the people had been armed, they would then seek to be treated on equal terms, wanting an equal share in the food rations. In this crisis would develop a move to democratic principles. As we have seen with Athens' development, once a group of people become important to a city's survival or prosperity, more concessions politically to the group were needed. If these demands were not met, 
this group threatened to come to terms with the Athenians and surrender the city. With this internal crisis now developing, the government of Mytilene had seen their position as hopeless. Extending concessions to the lower classes would completely dismantle their oligarchic system. Though they were also in no position to prevent the surrender of the city, so it was determined that it should be the current government who should come to terms with the Athenians. This they thought would afford them the best outcome. So, with the Peloponnesians still out in the Aegean, Mytilene would surrender to the Athenians. Thucydides would record the terms of surrender as follows. Athens was to have the right to act as she saw fit with regard to the people of Mytilene, and the army was allowed to enter the city. The Mytilenians were to send representatives to Athens to put their case, and until these representatives returned, Parshas was to undertake not to imprison or enslave or kill any of the population. Once Parshas had returned to Lesbos from his pursuit of the Peloponnesian fleet, he would go about reducing the various cities on the island who had been allied to Mytilene. Then when back in the sea to the revolt, he would send back to Athens those he saw as responsible for the revolt, as well as the Spartan advisor. From here, Athens would then look to decide on the fate of Mytilene in the wake of their failed revolt from the empire. The context that the considerations for Mytilene's fate would be on the backdrop of Athenians' experience after the four years of the Peloponnesian War. They had suffered invasions of their lands year after year, while also having to contend with the plague and its resurgence. Now, one of the more important allies had attempted to revolt when the financial situation in the empire was becoming tight. Not only this, but the Peloponnesians had been able to penetrate deep within the Aegean, where Athens had seen itself as holding naval supremacy. This would probably see many of those ready to debate the issue on Mytilene being afraid and angry of Athens' current situation. Before any talks on the Pinnix in Athens would take place, these emotions would be highlighted with their initial actions. They would put the Spartan who had been advising the Mytileans to death without a trial. This had even occurred after he had offered to persuade the Spartans to abandon their siege of Plataea in exchange for his life. However, after the execution of the Spartan advisor, debate in Athens on Mytilene's fate would develop. We don't get any of the speeches that would be delivered through Thucydides, but we would hear that in their current mood, they would decide that not only are those who were in their custody should be put to death, but all the men of Mytilene as well. They would then make slaves of all the women and children of the city. Thucydides would also point out that the extreme nature of this decision would result due to the revolt being long premeditated, and due to Mytilene not being a subject state like many others within the empire. With this decision being made, a trireme would be sent out at once to take these orders to Parshas, still on Lesbos, to carry out at once. However, the next day, it would seem some had had time to cool their emotions over the situation around Mytilene. This would see that the moderates within Athens were able to see a special assembly being called, to reconsider the decision made the previous day. This would see, in Thucydides' account, two figures put forward on each side of the new debate, that of Cleon, who we have met before, and Diodotus, who would be representing a good proportion of the moderates' views. However, there would be others that would address the assembly. It appears these two, however, would be on the far ends of the debate. The Athenian assembly was now convened to decide the fate of rebellious Mytilene. Cleon, the Athenian statesman, who Thucydides describes as being the most violent of the citizens, argued for the complete destruction of Mytilene as a deterrent to other rebellious allies. He believed that leniency would encourage more uprisings and that a harsh response was necessary to maintain Athenian dominance. Diodotus, on the other hand, spoke in favour of a more moderate approach. He argued against punishing the entire population of Mytilene, suggesting that only those directly involved in the rebellion should face severe consequences, Diodotus believing that Athens should demonstrate mercy and wisdom in its governance to foster long-term loyalty among its allies. The debate was intense, with emotions running high among the Athenian citizens. Cleon's argument appealed to the fear of further revolts, emphasising the need for a strong and decisive message. Diodotus, however, appealed to the reason and compassion, urging the assembly to consider the potential negative consequences 
of a harsh response. I must point out that this debate is represented by quite lengthy speeches in Thucydides' account, and I have just looked to sum up the main points of how each man spoke. If you are interested in checking out the full debate, you can find it beginning in Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War at Chapter 3, Paragraph 36. In the end, the Athenian assembly narrowly voted in favour of Diodotus' proposal. The decision was to spare the majority of Mytilene's population and execute only those directly responsible for the revolt. However, even this action was harsh and arbitrary, as the men that Parshas had sent back to Athens were done so on his own judgment of their involvement. No trial in Athens would be held for this roughly thousand guilty Mytilenes, and they would be put to death. This debate over the fate of Mytilene reflected the ongoing tension in Athenian politics between a more aggressive and punitive approach, represented by figures like Clown, and a more measured and diplomatic stance, exemplified by voices like Diodotus. It showcased the complexities of decision-making in times of war and the moral dilemmas faced by powerful states in handling rebellious subjects. So, a ship was dispatched in haste to deliver the news and prevent the previous order of total destruction from being carried out. The first ship carrying the orders for the death of all the men and enslavement of the rest of the population had a full day's head start. To help motivate the rowers of the second ship sent out, the Mytilene envoys in Athens provided food and drink to them all and promised them a reward if they could make it to Lesbos before the first ship. The second ship would set out at a fast pace as they left Piraeus and out into the Aegean. They would refuse to take stops for eating and sleep in a number of the usual locations along the way. Even though they took these measures and had no wind against them, when they came upon Lesbos, they could see that the first ship had already arrived. However, the second crew still put on land and rushed to Mytilene, where fortunately the decree had only just arrived a short time before them. They were able to interrupt Parshas, who was in the process of reading out the initial decree, and were able to prevent the massacre from unfolding. The fate of Mytilene had rested on a razor's edge, and by so little do they escape their danger. So, the people who were still in Mytilene had escaped death and enslavement. But Athens would now take measures that would see that the city and the areas it controlled coming under their influence. The defensive works of the city were taken down and the land was divided up and handed over to the Athenian shareholders, who the Mytilenians would have to pay rent to. Mytilene and the towns it had previously controlled were now all under Athenian influence, this seeing this previously somewhat autonomous city in the Athenian Empire, now a subject state of Athens. For this episode, I had for the most part decided to follow this developing story of the revolt on Lesbos to its conclusion. This saw us move through 428 BC and into 427, where the revolt had come to an end and Mytilene's fate was decided. Next series episode will be remaining in these years as we'll be returning to the situation of Plataea. As you may remember, Sparta had marched onto this small polis during the invasion of 429 and had placed it under siege. Now we shall return to the siege and look what was taking place and look at how the siege would end and what this would mean for Plataea and Athens. While we'll also be looking at some civil unrest that would be developing on an island that we had featured when looking at the road to war. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting you on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. If you've also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series.